working with David Mackay a few years back and then decided to move to Max Planck in, uh, in Tübingen. And I think he's settled down there for, uh, for a longer time now. And so Philip, Philip is, really, is a really interesting person. He's like exploring various topics of machine learning and Bayesian inference. And recently he has like settled on, on this probabilistic numerics topic but before that, or maybe in parallel, you're still doing Bayesian optimization up to, I don't know where you take the time, because he also just got a baby. Or maybe, but he told me he sleeps a lot. So I, I don't understand how you do this. Anyway, so today uh, he's going to talk, uh, focus more on Bayesian optimization. So Mike's going to talk about probabilistic numerics, I think. I think we're both going to talk about that. Yeah. Well, we'll, yeah, we'll okay. slowly slide from one topic yeah, to the so other, I is, think. Uh, maybe it's a joint talk yeah. with a coffee break in, in, in the middle. So. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to it. Just one little announcement. That coffee break system is an hour and a half. It'll just be an hour, it'll be a half hour, and then we'll have a discussion after Mike's talk. Okay, so it's a half hour coffee break after Philip. So thanks a lot, Mark, for a very nice introduction. I'm, I, I'm, I'm blessed with a very uh, calm baby that sleeps a lot. So this is not this is not my doing. It's completely. So I'll I'll try, and um, I've been basically sitting here all day shifting slides around throwing things out and throwing things in in response to what has been said in the previous talks. Uh, nevertheless, there will be overlap with the, with the previous slides, uh, the previous talks. So I apologize in advance. You'll see a few things that you've already seen today, but maybe that's good. Maybe then sort of some of the ideas will sort of settle in. So I'll try to um, broaden the discussion a little bit about why we're doing Bayesian optimization, how we're doing it, and what we are applying it to. And to do that, let's start with what we're currently applying it to. So here is my cartoon picture of um, a learning machine or an intelligent system or an acting agent, an autonomous, whatever you want, whatever the word of the day is to, desc to describe these kind of uh, algorithms or setups, which are using, so what this is, is there is a, there's a, the world that we live in out here, and this is a machine that interacts with the world. What this machine does is it collects data, uses this data to build a model of the world, this is this blue thing, and then it predicts changes in the world as a function of what it does in the world. And it then tries to sort of choose some actions in the real world so that these predicted changes somehow look good, that it's hoping to achieve something in the world. How does it do that? Well, to build the, the, this model, it maybe retains some variables, so things that it assigns a probability measure to, and then infers a posterior distribution over those variables. That involves Bayesian inference, so marginalization and conditioning, which is basically integration. Um, it uh, optimizes some parameters, so that's an optimization problem. We've heard a lot about optimization already. Maybe it trains a neural network or something big like that, right? And to predict future changes, it solves some kind of differential description of the world and then chooses actions, again, by optimization, but because the optimization is intertwined with the prediction, we call it control. Okay, so sometimes we have machines that don't do any of this, and they only have parameters. Maybe they just train a neural network. Or sometimes you have machines that don't have parameters, that just train a GP and only return probability distributions. I'm going to subsume all of that in this kind of cartoon picture. Sometimes you have machines that only make predictions and they don't choose anything. That's also in this picture. So the area that Bayesian optimization is currently making money in is in making these algorithms better by changing sort of the high level structure of these methods by fitting, by changing the, the architecture of these kind of algorithms. So this is the kind of task that as far as I understand people are being bought for, people are being paid for, and where people are really excited about Bayesian optimization. So here's an example of that. Oh, Ando, you have a question. Where's the reward? Ah, so the, so the reward is sort of a function that's maybe part of this, of, of this computation somehow, right? You, there's, in here there might be a loss function, you said, this thing should look good as a function of this. So again, it's a cartoon. It's sort of, I, I'm, the point of this cartoon is to point out the kinds of computation that we're performing. It's not to capture every variable in the computation, it's the, the kind of computation. It's integration, optimization, solving differential equations, and control, which is optimization of differential equations. Right? So, sorry to interrupt you so early. The, is the reason for this, this came up also when Mark was talking about reinforcement learning. Because a lot of what's going on in reinforcement learning right now has no model. Like in the sense of producing a model. Okay, that's then um, this is sort of the, the subset of this where there's parameters here and um, you just sort of 
choosing some loss function that so then this is sort of future data maybe. You're building a model of expected reward. Sorry. Yeah, then maybe you have sort of a set of data and you're just sort of doing some kind of optimization on the data. The point of this plot or this picture is to say the kind of computations we're performing is optimization, integration, solving differential equations, and control. By the way, this includes all, everything linear algebra because linear algebra can be used to do all of these tasks. So a special case for these. Right? Okay, so here's, a, here's an example of a recent paper of this. Uh, this is not by me. This is a paper from the AutoML workshop at, at ICML. It's done by someone in the room, Aaron, and other people from Freiburg. Are you the only one from Freiburg here at the moment? So anyone else I'm missing? So if you'd like to understand how these methods work, you should talk to Aaron. It's always good to have someone to sort of have, a have a paper from, from the audience, I think, just to sort of have something else to talk about. So yes, this is kind of what these algorithms look like in a paper, right? This is sort of my cartoon picture. This is what's going on. It's sort of, there's a high-level architecture. There's various different machine learning algorithms in the mix, and they're deciding to sort of focus on particular algorithms and change the architecture of some of these algorithms to improve their performance. And that's the kind of problem that we've been hearing about all day, more or less. It's this kind of problem. It's this, there are three data points so far. Where's the minimum of this function? Right? And of course, it's not a one-dimensional space. It's a high-dimensional space. But it's this kind of, there is something complicated underneath, which you don't see. And you'd like to find a point where this function has its minimum. So, and I'll spend the first 10 minutes of this talk reiterating some of the sort of thoughts that we had uh, about three years ago about this kind of problem, this particular kind of setting. Um, even though Matt has basically already introduced all these ideas to you, I'm just going to re reiterate them a little bit to maybe sort of strengthen some of the points. I'll try to do all of that in pictures so that we'll, so we'll get through it relatively quickly. So here's this kind of picture that we've all seen before. What do we do? We don't know what the function is, so we're going to assign a probability measure over the function space to say what might a true function be. And it's going to be a Gaussian process because if you want to have a probability measure, it's very difficult to come up with something over function spaces, which is not a variant of a Gaussian process. OK, so um, and then here are these two major algorithms that we've uh, already heard several times today. Um, actually, there are three algorithms on this picture, and I'll tell you where the third one is hidden. Um, probability of improvement and expected improvement. What I've plotted here is, I'm not sure how helpful this is. But what I've done is, I've, let's say this is the best evaluation we've had so far. Now I've put a, an intersection through this multivariate Gaussian distribution across this line, and then plotted at regular intervals these Gaussian distributions. These are these gray bars here, which amount to this univariate Gaussian distribution at each point. Right? This is this marginal Gaussian distribution, the property of a Gaussian process. What you could do is you could sum up the mass in these little tails everywhere. That's called the probability of improvement. That gives you this gray line. Or you could sum up the mass of that function multiplied by a linear function that gives you these orange objects. If you integrate over them, you get the expected improvement. That's this orange line here. The important thing about this is this is a totally local computation. So what we're doing at each point is we ask, there's a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution here. And what's the chance that if I evaluate there, I'll get a small number? Right? What's the chance I get a small number, or what's the expected sort of lowness of that number? And in that sense, it's a totally local kind of computation. And this, why, why is this? It's because the task we're trying to solve here is, as David just like, very eloquently presented, is to collect a sequence of low function values. So the description of this kind of Bayesian optimization task is, let's try to find a strategy that ensures we're going to get small numbers. Now, if you think about this application example, that's not really what you are trying to do here, right? So a typical setting is, um, as Nando said this morning, you kind of you get your data set in. Now you have a choice of different sort of hyperparameters or architecture parameters for your machine. You're going to try out a few, and eventually you'll decide this is the machine I'm going to use. That's what I'm going to ship to my customer. So that means there's a prototyping phase where we don't actually care about the function values we are collecting. What we care about is that the final machine we hand out. That should be a good one, right? So it doesn't actually matter what those function values are in between. What matters more is to learn where the optimum is somehow. And that somehow is what I'm going to try to uh, explain in the next three slides. Here's one way of thinking about that. What you could do is you could take this Gaussian measure. This is this Gaussian process distribution from before. It's the same distribution. 
And you could ask, what's the probability for any of these points to be the global minimum of this function? And one way to do that, that's not the algorithm we're going to use, but it's a sort of a simplistic way of thinking about that, is to draw lots and lots and lots of these dashed red lines and decide for each of these red lines, where is the global minimum? Those are these uh, little squares that hop around here. Let's do that a lot, and then let's do a histogram over those points. And that's what this green curve here is. That's the probability measure over the location of the minimum. And that's clearly a very different kind of object from the red, uh, sorry, the yellow and the grayish line. It, for example, it has very interesting features, like two point masses over here. Because there's a certain, with a certain probability, because this is a smooth function, a differentiable function, at the boundary point, with a certain probability, this function has a negative derivative, a positive derivative. And then there's kind of a whole region that is kind of excluded, that cannot have, cannot contain a local minimum. And that this might be pushed over here, and you get some kind of mass like that. OK, so now a naive thing to do would be to say, oh, OK, so let's just evaluate where the maximum of this, of this distribution is, because that's sort of likely to be the minimum. But that doesn't do what we actually want to do. We're, do we're not trying to, to to just evaluate at the minimum, we're trying to learn what this, this, what the, where the minimum actually is. We're trying to shape this distribution such that it becomes informative about where the minimum is. So what we're going to have to do is to reason about what happens to this green distribution if we evaluate, if we perform an experiment at some point in the input space. So for example, let's say I'm going to do two more experiments, one over here and one over here. Right? Uh, these are all these, all these things in this animation, these are all things that might happen. These are all observations that I might potentially make. And these two, by the way, are, so these are draws from the Gaussian process, joint draws. And the change that they make to this distribution, that's this Gaussian process draw that David mentioned. By the way, the, the control engineers have figured out this a long time before any of us. They call this the innovation process. So that's the term to Google for, by the way, I think. Um, so that's sort of something from the sort of 60s or so. Um, uh, and you see sort of every single possible instance of what we, what we might see as a result of our experiment, which is a Gaussian draw, will change this distribution in a very non-trivial, non-Gaussian kind of way. Right? So if we happen to see a very small function value here, then we get a lot of mass over here for the minimum. If we happen to see a, a, a high function value, then we kind of exclude this entire region. So this has a lot of non-local effect, this kind of evaluation. By evaluating over here, we can, if you're lucky, we can exclude this entire region. Not just this one point, but this entire region will be affected by this evaluation. And this region over here might perhaps not be so, if so strongly affected by this evaluation. OK, so now we will have to sort of average over these potential changes and say for each of these changes whether we like that change or not. Right? So if you stop this video at, at some point, you, you'd have to say, sort of, is this the distribution that I find informative or not? And a way to encode this, this formality is to evaluate the the change in entropy between what you had before you made these evaluations, the distribution over the minimum before you made the evaluations, and the distribution over the minimum after you've made the evaluation, and then marginalize over all the things you might potentially see. If you do that, you get this black line here, which tells you to evaluate over here, because this is sort of a region which is not quite unlikely to contain the minimum. And it, it's sort of by evaluating here, we cover this entire range and kind of get information about this area. Why is this a sort of, ah, so here's kind of a, a one slide of a little bit of mathematics, right, to sort of formalize this. So what we're going to do is we'll change an, we'll, we'll choose an evaluation point which maximizes an expected change in the distribution, or, uh, sorry, a, a loss function over the change of the distribution as a function of the next evaluation. And one possible interesting loss function, and the one that I'm going to stick with for the next five minutes, is the entropy of that distribution. That's also the one that uh, Matt talked about. You could also come up with other loss functions. And in the paper, we actually didn't do that. We just pointed out that you could, right? So that nobody can claim that we hadn't thought about it yet. Of course, <laughs> no. So you, if you want to really, this, this might be an interesting thing to try. So for example, you could say, maybe what I really care about is the localization of the minimum. So maybe the task I have is not to optimize some machine learning method, but my task is to drill a hole somewhere in a Siberian steppe to find uh, gas. Right? Then the, my cost function of the final experiment of drilling the hole will depend on how close I get to the maximal source of gas. It doesn't, like, it doesn't help if I have three point masses very far apart that sort of say it's either over there, or it's there, or it's here. So let's just drill at any of those three points. 
it's much more helpful to say it's kind of in this region, and then you can drill a little bit sideways to get, your, to get to your gas. If it's a machine learning problem, it's more likely that what you're looking for is this kind of entropy formulation. You'd like to just collect information about the minimum. Here's an example of why this is um, important, why, why this is quite different, sort of an extreme example of how this is quite different from these local evaluations, from expected improvement and the other sort of various examples. This is a, a sort of unt untypical Gaussian process. It's a parametric relief over a quadratic function. So um, uh, maybe sort of as an example of a Gaussian process that has does, doesn't have a Gaussian kernel because I think all the previous talks had, had Gaussian kernels. So here is one that doesn't have a Gaussian kernel. It's a parametric belief. There are just two numbers in here that we don't know. There's a curvature and a gradient. No, not, not quite, right? There's kind of a, there's a, there's a linear function and a quadratic function, and they both have a weight that we don't know. And we, what we can do is we can evaluate this function with a fixed Gaussian noise of, in this case, one, actually, I think. So now, this is the distribution over the minimum that are computed in the same way as before. So if you wanted to evaluate where the minimum is, you should evaluate here in the middle. But that's actually a very bad kind of experiment because you kind of know what's going to happen. It's not going to provide much information, right? It's just quite likely to give you a very low function value, but it's not actually t going to tell you much. If you want to evaluate at the point where you get a lot of information about those two numbers that you need to know to figure out where the minimum is, you should evaluate as it happens at this point, or in fact, actually also at this point over here. Why? Because there's kind of an interplay between those two features. So to know where the minimum of this function is, you need to know the ratio between those two numbers, those two unknown numbers. Right? So to figure out that ratio, the best signal-to-noise ratio you get is to evaluate at that point. So it's a really, really very different kind of formulation. Right? Why would you want to do that? Well, uh, so we've already, so this is kind of the first argument. It's just a different kind of thing to do. There have been a few more examples of uh, why to do that in, in more recent papers, which are both actually cases that we've also heard today applied to algorithms that use expected improvement and other sort of uh, utilities. And that's the inclusion of a cost function for experiments. So imagine you're going to tra train several different neural networks. And you could train them with a different data set size. So you could do an exploratory experiment with 1,000 data points, or you could do an exploratory experiment with a billion data points. And they are going to give you different information about how to optimally set your neural network. Then what you need is you need some way of trading off the cost of training this method with how much information it gives you about how the optimal machine works. So doing that is, I think, quite difficult to do with something like expected improvement because you would have to come up with a cost for like, with, a, with a value assigned to the low function value you might get in this exploratory experiment compared to how much it costs to perform this experiment. I don't think there is a natural way to do that. But you can come up with you, like the, the entropy of the minimum over the, of, of the true function. That's an object that has kind of at least roughly a meaning in information theory. So you can trade it off. And that, that was, uh, was a paper, uh, the first one that I know about this was uh, by uh, uh, the Harvard guys in uh, 2013. Maybe there were other ones already before. This is definitely the first paper that uses this entropy search framework for this. Another thing to do is, um, as Matt already mentioned, is to include unknown constraints. So I've been recently been doing some, some collaboration with um, control people, and I had to learn that that's actually a super important aspect. Like Nando like said this morning as well. Most people don't know where the constraints are for the experiment. So if you're going to run your robot walk walker, when you start the experiment, you don't know where the parameter settings are, where it falls over, right? And when it falls over, you sort of, you claim it's not actually a successful experiment. So that's a very different kind of observation. You have to model that, and modeling that in a probabilistic way requires that you, that you are able to do these uh, kind of, this, this kind of, that, that, that you're able to assign a meaningful value to the information content of a single experiment. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'll actually skip some of the next parts. I'll just very quickly flash through them because they, were, they would explain an algorithm that Matt has just explained a lot better. So in our paper, we sort of, we, we, that, that was a little bit earlier, so this is in 2012. This is the one paper where I don't have the citation up there, uh, one slide. Um, we sort of pointed out that there's two challenges in this kind of, in actually performing this computation. The first one is that this distribution over the minimum is is a non-parametric one. It's quite, it, it, it's sort of, it, it's defined over this dense space. So giving sense to this distribution is quite hard. 
And then even if you discretize this space in a non-uniform way, you're still facing a, a multivariate Gaussian integration problem of the, a similar type to the one that David um, just mentioned. So uh, we had to perform both of these, and we found sort of approximate solutions for both of them. And if I understood Matt right, then they're sort of a little bit superseded now by more recent computations. So I'll just flip through them. The first idea is that you're going to create some kind of non-uniform tiling of the space that gives you good resolution for your computation in areas that are likely to contain the minimum and low resolution in areas that are quite unlikely to contain the minimum so that this tessellation kind of scales. It's a bit complicated, as you can see from this plot, so I'll leave it out. And then once you even have your, once you have your discretization, you need to figure out the probability for each of your discrete points to be the location of the minimum of your function. And this could be done by performing uh, by computing sort of a multivariate error function numerically. One way to do that in a, is sort of as a perhaps sort of unusual way for a, from a numerical perspective, but a quite natural one for a machine learner is to use an approximate inference method called expected, expected uh, called, called expectation propagation, or EP, um, which is essentially a way to fit Gaussian distributions to non-Gaussian distributions. And then because they're Gaussian distributions, you can evaluate their mass right, a normalization constant, and they'll tell you what the integral over this region is. So here is kind of an example. Uh, this is kind of, this is our joint Gaussian prior over two function values. You'd like to know what the probability is for this one to be the minimum. So for this to be, no, sorry, for this one to be the minimum. So for this to be smaller than this, that's the mass in this region of the Gaussian. That's obviously not a Gaussian object. It's just a subset of a Gaussian. This is a Gaussian fitted to that distribution, which has the right moments. So it gives you kind of the right mass. Okay. Um, that's the entire algorithm, it's not so important. So here's a kind of the uh, quick takeaway from this. As we've already heard several times today, these plots are pretty useless. So this is just one, one, one example of this algorithm running compared to lots of other algorithms, and of course performing better than all the other ones, because otherwise you can't publish a paper like this. <laughs> so it's actually in here to point out how silly these plots are. We've already seen a lot, uh, much, much better plots for Mac today comparisons, we know that these algorithms are sort of performing quite differently on different kind of settings. The only thing you can take away from this plot is this is the algorithm, all of these algorithms running on model. So here is an actual draw from a Gaussian process with the correct kernel. Let's find the minimum, or let's figure out what the minimum is. And this is the distance, so each, after each evaluation, the, fact that the algorithm is asked, where do you think the minimum is? And then in this plot, we are measuring the distance between the estimated point and the true minimum. By the way, that's not the loss that the algorithm is trying to optimize, right? But it still outperforms sort of the other ones in this particular setting. This up here, by the way, are local optimization methods. So that's just to point out that that's a non-trivial optimization problem, right? So they, these don't work. Uh, this is out of model, but still a draw from a Gaussian process. So that's a very minor change. Everything sort of the most important thing is that these lines sort of become larger. It's just these methods perform, all of them perform a little bit worse. Here's an interesting plot. This is regret. So this is, again, the true function is a draw from the correct Gaussian process. Let's run these methods and then sum up the function values that they collected. So now this algorithm, of course, is not going to be the best one because it's not what it's trying to do. It's not in any way trying to collect low function values. It's just prototyping, right? So that's why, uh, so now in this case, actually, is, as it happens, PI is the best method for this particular experiment. And for some reason, GPUCP is the worst, even though that's the one that's supposed to minimize regret. Or not, actually not, not to minimize, but it's just that that's the only algorithm out of those four which actually has a guarantee for it, a bound for its regret, right? The other ones don't have guarantees. Yeah, Does have that as well? Okay, good, then that's good. That's the second worst one, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So this is the takeaway for part one, which is this kind of outer loop picture. I think if we are using Bayesian optimization to prototype machines, then um, in many cases, it's not always true, but in many cases, what we're really trying to do is to collect information about the location of the minimum, not to collect low function values. And it's actually possible to model this explicitly by building a probability distribution over the minimum. And for me, that's really what Bayesian optimization is about. It's using probability measures to describe the task you're trying to solve. In this case, it's a probability measure over the minimum. 
And doing this is a very expensive kind of computation. So these, entrop these entropy-based formulations, are like, even in maths formulation, are still more or less the most expensive thing we have in the vision optimization toolbox, I think, right? because these computations are quite elaborate. It's feasible. So we now have an implementation of this algorithm and see which does these kind of this choice of where to evaluate next in a reasonably average sized problem in something like a second. So it's not, it's not like super expensive, but it's the kind of thing that you will only use to optimize architecture. It's not the method that you will run in your inner loop, right? So let's think about this inner loop a little bit. So I'm returning to my cartoon picture of the various kind of computations that we're performing inside. As it turns out, virtually all of these algorithms also optimize something. They are also fitting something. They are also kind of choosing parameters somehow, but it's just usually not treating this as Bayesian optimization. My favorite example is training neural networks. Right? Everyone now likes training neural networks. They have these billions of parameters. And for some reason, we're still not using Rambo to train neural networks. Is that? Well, it's not because we haven't tried. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and? <laughs> well, it's, I don't think the intrinsic dimensionality of a model that has half a gig in parameters, they really are billion yeah. parameters. So neural networks actually are really high dimensional. But we're still using optimization methods to train these methods. So the question I, uh, I would like to pose is whether the idea of using probability measures to optimize, to find the unknown correct value of some parameter should really be uh, sort of something separate from Bayesian optimization. Somehow, I think that at the moment at least, the Bayesian optimization discussion is a lot about this outer loop methods because in this setting, you're allowed to, to spend a lot of computation to build a really good method, right? You're, you're sort of, because this is a big, expensive computation, you're allowed to take this liberty of, last, like, like I just did, build this super elaborate algorithm that builds a probability measure and then tries to shape this measure. But once you talk about these inner loop methods, it gets a lot harder because your computational budget is extremely more constrained. But conceptually, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to use probability measures. Right? The Gaussian process community is maybe, maybe the best example of people pointing out that Bayesian computations do not have to be expensive, at least. Right? Within reason. So let's talk about the most e elementary, the other end of the complexity scale, the most elementary kind of optimization method out there, and that's gradient descent. So this is the problem. We have some objective function. And now you should think of x as a billion parameters in a neural network, weights. And uh, we would like to, there's some, some loss function, some energy, some training error. And we'd like to reduce that. So what we'll do is we'll locally approximate this function by its uh, constant plus gradient, so by a linear function. And then all that, all that this tells us is the direction in which we're supposed to walk. Right? The direction to walk in is the gradient, or the negative gradient. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us how far to walk. Right? So a uh, quick check, hands up, who has trained a neural network before? By now, that should be almost the entire room. Okay? <laughs> uh, who has used? Who has used for this task any variant of stochastic or gradient descent? It's probably almost the same people, right? There's just sort of a few hands up or down. Including Newton masters, Actually, actually not, not, but uh, so, so including, including things that change the direction. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. In including any kind of thing that replaces this with some other direction. Yeah. Then you've noticed that you have to choose this learning rate, right, this alpha. And that's a really annoying thing. So for gradient descent, it's actually a super annoying thing because there's no natural scale for this object. If I have three minutes, allow me to sort of elaborate on this a little bit because I like sort of bashing gradient descent for this kind of weakness that it has. Imagine your task is not to train a neural network, but to uh, ski down a hill. So I'm a physicist originally. I like these kind of physical explanations. So here's my favorite uh, sort of way of explaining this. Let's, let's imagine, so, that, so the problem with this is, that this object here, that's a change. This does not work. That's a change of a function value divided by a change of location. So the units of that are the units of f divided by the units of x. Right? That's not the same as the units of the new location x. 
It's just not right. right? It just doesn't work. So imagine your loss function f is your energy per mass. So you'd like to reduce your potential energy per mass. You're up on a hill. You're skiing. You'd like to ski down. You'd like to get rid of potential energy. Then you could evaluate your potential energy which, uh, per mass, because I'm not going to tell you my body mass. Right? Uh, let's say you're, so I'm, I'm, I'm from, a, from a part of the world that is reasonably hilly. Pubigan has sort of ups and downs, a lot more than Sheffield, even though this is called the Peak District. So uh, let's say you're 450 meters high. Sheffield is about 100 meters high, so Tübingen is 450 meters high. Uh, then my potential energy per kilogram of my body mass, because I'm a European and I like to use SI units, is 4,473 kilojoule per kilogram. And the gradient of that hill, because it's a reasonably steep hill, as it happens, is 5 joules per kilogram a meter. So if I ski, then I'm going to use a learning rate. Oh, I'm going to set my learning rate. Oh, it's roughly 1, OK? Because people set their learning rate to 1 or to 0.1. So then what I'm going to do is the sort of agent that I'm optimizing my potential mass is I'm going to move for about 5 meters, because that's what this number is, reevaluate the gradient, change the direction I'm skiing in, ski for 5 meters, change the direction again, and try to get down the hill. That's a reasonably good algorithm. Next to me up on the hill is my American cousin who is using uh, empirical, empirical units. Maybe it's even a British cousin, I'm not sure. Uh, so in, in imperial units, you're measuring your, your energy in calories, not in joule, and you're measuring your uh, weight in ounces rather than in kilograms, and you're measuring your distances in feet rather than in meters. So for this person, the exact same problem is that he has a potential energy of 30.31 calories per ounce, and the gradient is one, uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 5 calories per ounce in foot. So what this person is going to do is going to be standing next to me on the exact same hill. He's going to ski for 10 to the minus 5 feet, which is roughly a micrometer, right? <laughs> <Let's go. coughs> and then uh, decide to turn a little bit because the gradient has ever so slightly changed, and then take another step, and then right, do that again. And he's never going to make it down the hill, right? And that's, that's really a fundamental problem with gradient descent, that you don't know how to set this thing right. And it's part of the reason why people have to spend so much time initializing their neural networks right so that the initial gradient is a reasonably well-scaled object. Right? You have to think about how you draw your initial weights. You have to rescale your training set so that it has the right units. If you use MNIST, you can't use the binary, or you have to use the binary values rather than the 256 uh, bits, right? So it's kind of... It just makes things more complicated and restricts how you can run your algorithm. So we need an algorithm that takes care of this, that makes it, that figures out what the step size is. Now, if, you are, if we had to train a numerical problem that had no noise, there's an algorithm that does that for you. It's called a line search. And it has been, it was invented, well, around the 60s, sort of, and it's considered a solved problem. Nobody in numerical analysis worries about these algorithms anymore. They're just done. And what these methods do is, someone chooses for you the search direction you're going to step in. Maybe it's the gradient. Maybe it's a damped gradient. Maybe it's the quasi-Newton direction. Maybe it's the Newton direction, whatever. It's just some search direction. And now your task is to figure out in this one-dimensional subspace how far to move. Okay? Now what you're going to do is, this is sort of a formalization of what these methods do. It's an algorithm that proceeds in sort of three steps, essentially. We start at... So we know in which direction we're going to step in. We're going to take a positive step. So we start at sort of intrinsic value zero in this direction. And then what we can do is we can evaluate at various points the value of the function of the objective and its gradient, because we have access to the gradient. And that gradient projected onto this one-dimensional space is just a, a line. It's just a single number. Right? So what these methods then do is a variation of the following. You start with an exploratory step. And then you check after each step whether these two conditions are fulfilled. These are called the Wolfe conditions. And what they say is, the first one says, I would like to have a function value, so the height of this value, should be below the initial value plus a damped version of the first gradient. And that's this black line. So we want to be below this, this region because we want to descend. Also, we want to have a region where the gradient is flat. Right? If, you have a, if you still have a steep gradient, which is over here, it seems like we have not actually reached a minimum yet. We've descended, but you could descend more by just keeping, keep going. So we also need a second constraint, which says the gradient, the steepness of this function, should be less than the initial value of the gradient times some small constant less than 1. And that's what these pinwheels are representing. So what the method is going to do is it's going to make an initial step, which turns out to be way too short, because we have a badly scaled problem. 
it'll extend that step by, I think, roughly, it's not even doubling this. It's more than, more than doubling the step. It's going to be some extrapolation that says this might, might be a better place. Still not good, because we're still descending. We'll make a much larger step. Oh, figured out we've, we are now above this line, so we've gone too far. So we'll now intersect. We'll use these two points to decide where to put our next point. Maybe this will be here. And then we'll discover, oh, we're still not done. Now we are descending again. Let's take another point. Ah, now we're fine. So now this is not a zero gradient. It's just a the gradient which is sufficiently small. And then I can accept this point for, for sort of just this inter intermediate step and continue from there. OK. So why does this not work for our neural networks? Well, it, wor it doesn't work because in contemporary machine learning, data sets are too large to evaluate this function perfectly without noise. What we have instead is a situation like this. So our true loss function is, which ideally would be the sum over the loss over all data points in the data set, is not quite evaluable because there's a very large number m in here. Maybe it's like, I don't know, how many data points does ImageNet have? Quite a few, uh, several million or so. And um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use batches. So we'll just, in every step, only evaluate a small subset of the entire data set, maybe a single data point, maybe 10 data points, maybe 100, and evaluate the gradients for each of these sort of sub points and sum those up. And that's going to be our sort of s approximate loss. And that's going to give us a noisy version of the initial gradient. And the noise will have something to do with how many data points we've chosen. Right? And it'll be approximately Gaussian if we choose the indices of those data points iid from the entire data set. Because then this is a sum over iid random variables, so that's approximately a Gaussian number. So that's exactly the setting we have in Bayesian optimization, right? There's an unknown function. It's actually univariate, this function. And we can evaluate it with Gaussian noise. We even have access to the gradients. Wonderful. So why are we not using Bayesian optimization? Ah, because it's expensive. <coughs> So we should somehow get rid of this expensiveness of Bayesian optimization so that we can use this to rebuild something like a line search. And that's what I'm going to tell you in the next five slides how to do that. This is work uh, done by Maren, who's sitting over there. And it's going to be in NIPS this year. It's going to be in oral, so you can, you're going to hear Maren talk about this at NIPS. Um, so I'm sort of stealing her mojo for that. I, I, can't, I can't tell you to invite her to DeepMind because I'm already telling you. What the, and I already was at DeepMind last week to tell about, talk about this, so Maren cannot go there anymore. Maybe invite her next year. OK, so what we'll need is three different ingredients. One of them will turn out to be Bayesian optimization. And the other ones will turn out to be things that are closely related to Bayesian optimization. We need a model for this function L. And you can already guess what it's going to be. We'll need a rule for where to evaluate that function. And I'm sure you can also already guess what it's going to be. And then the only slightly non-trivial thing to do is we have to decide when to stop. Because these, these rules here will not work anymore because we are going to get these lines and these points with noise. So sometimes, sort of, if you add a little bit of noise here, you might just ac have accepted this point erroneously. And if you add a little bit, well, quite stark noise here, you might have accepted this point erroneously. So we'll have to somehow s say something about what the risk is of accepting a certain point, even if you're uncertain what the gradient is. OK. So, um, First one, the objective is pretty obvious. It's going to be a Gaussian process, but it's not going to be any old Gaussian process. We'll choose a Gaussian process which works well with the kind of objective functions that we have to deal with. A Gaussian process with this covariance. Why is this an interesting choice? It's an interesting choice for two reasons. The first one is that this is a method that, well, what this is is, is, the, is the GP interpretation of cubic splines. That's what it is. So the Wiener process is a linear spline interpolation method. The integrated Wiener process is a cubic spline. The next integration of the Wiener process would be the quintic spline. Right? So there's a good thing about splines, and that is, A, that they are quite robust, relatively robust, to nasty behavior in the, in the function, because they have, a, they have a local kind of structure. They are Markov processes. So if you evaluate the function and its gradient, 
at some points, then this decouples the behavior of this function in the cells in between data points. That means if you have a really crazy data point somewhere, it can't really hurt you all that much because all it can do is can mess up a sub-region of your entire domain. That's different from a square exponential kernel, which can mess up everything everywhere with a single data point. The other advantage of having a locally cubic model, a cubic spline, is that the derivative of a cubic is a quadratic, a univariate quadratic. So computing the minimum of that univariate quadratic is a single floating point. Like it's not a single floating point operation, but it's a single operation of a few floating point operations. It's a very simple kind of computation. It's just a division and multiplication. So if we have what I'm plotting here, by the way, so that you're not too confused about this, is given these three data points, given this GP, that's the posterior distribution over the function. This is the posterior distribution over its gradient. That's still a GP. And these are the next two derivatives of this prior mean, uh, sorry, of this posterior mean. And you can see that these are obviously now piecewise linear, piecewise constant functions. So the next derivative is zero. That's why this is a cubic spline. These two objects are not Gaussian processes anymore. They're just numbers. Because this is already a Wiener process, so its derivative is just white noise. But it has a mean function which has this property. So if you wanted to know where the minima of, these, of, of, of this kind of uh, posterior mean function is, just a mean function, to maybe get some candidate points to think about, we can, having made something like six evaluations like this, just move through the individual cells. So this is cell one, two, three, four, five, six. In each cell, ask, where is your local minimum of, is there even a local minimum of the posterior mean? And doing so costs number of step blocks times an extremely small, simple operation. And it'll tell us that this cell does not contain a local minimum. Well, the local minimum is this point, so we don't need to evaluate there again. This cell doesn't, this cell doesn't. This cell does contain a local minimum over here in the mean. This cell does as well. And then towards the right, there are no more minima, but we might want to, ex we might want to explore a little bit further. So we'll just add another point at a step that is the width of this final cell, or it's some kind of exploration parameter. Okay. And now we have to decide, and maybe actually I should point out that that's sort of a design choice. Instead of going, instead of going, uh, reasoning about all of these points and where to evaluate next, we will only reason about these three points, this one, this one, and the exploration point. So we'll decide that we're not even going to evaluate our Bayesian uh, optimization objective on any of these regions here. And that now means if we, for example, use expected improvement, we're only going to have to compute three numbers. No optimizer, no, no, no numerical subroutine of this, of this uh, algorithm. It's just three numbers, compute three expected improvements, take the largest one, and then evaluate there. So that's Bayesian optimization at an extremely sort of skeletonized version. It's this, the cheapest way to break down Bayesian optimization. We're going to pay a price for that. It's not y your typical Bayesian optimization anymore. There is no, uh, it's a lot harder to make these kind of guarantee statements about uh, no, not having no empty balls and like, bounce on the regrets and so on. But we're not trying to do that. Right? We're just trying to get rid of the step size selection in stochastic gradient descent. I think that's an important kind of fundamental decision that Bayesian optimization does not necessarily have to be about getting the probabilistic formulation perfectly right. For me, I think the value of Bayesian optimization is to use probability measures to make computations more robust or more exploratory or to somehow steer exploration and control of computations using probability measures. And this is a very rough way of doing that, but it's also an extremely cheap way of doing that. It adds extremely few additional operations to what you would normally do with a line search. So now we're almost done. There's a third point. We need to also decide when to stop this computation. And that's something that Bayesian optimization can perhaps not give such a good answer to, but, we do, but it doesn't have to. Instead, we can just look at what the classic numerical methods do and ask whether we can reproduce this behavior. So up here are these two Wolfer conditions again. So that's the requirement to be above, uh, sorry, below this kind of gray shaded area. And that's the requirement to be outside of the pinwheel, to be flat. And if you look at this, then what you see is these are inequalities which involve function values and derivatives in a linear form. So they do, they do not involve the square of a function value. They don't involve the logarithm of a function value. They're just the function values are the gradients. So you can rewrite these two equations as 
the statement that there are two numbers A and B, two real numbers, which are a linear projection of those four function values. And those two numbers should both be larger than zero. So we have a joint Gaussian belief over these four numbers, of course, because we have a Gaussian process belief over them. So we also have a joint Gaussian belief over these two numbers, which are linear projections of these Gaussian distributions. And that means that yeah, we can just ask this joint Gaussian distribution, what's your probability, what's the octant probability, or quadrant, sorry, quadrant probability for both of these numbers to be positive? And that's a bivariate error function. And as David pointed out, there are fast numerical methods to do that. You can just download them from the web. Um, and this is kind of what these things are. It doesn't really matter. Right? It's just a bunch of numbers. So everything in this expression is scalars. There's no vector, no matrix here. Uh, here's again a picture of what this does. So here, I, this is the same picture as before. Here are our six data points, now with noise. I should point out that, by the way, it's quite unusual for a line search to take six steps. A good line search should take one step, because it should, right? it should just say, oh, you've done good. Just go on. It's fine. But these are boring plots. So I can, here's a plot with six points to make it a little more interesting. Um, uh, these are the same points, actually, from the noise-less plot at the beginning with added noise. And now uh, we can ask for both of these wolf conditions, what's the probability for the first one to be fulfilled? What's the probability for the second one to be fulfilled? So you can see sort of the first one kind of tells you to take a large step, sort of move away, try to descend as far as you can. And the second one tries to sort of hold you back. Don't go in regions that have large gradients. Stay to the regions that have uh, sort of small gradient. This is the correlation between those two numbers. And then the joint probability for them is this curve. So there's a, there's a variant of the Wolfer conditions, which is called the strong Wolfer condition, which doesn't use um, these numbers, but uses an absolute value on the on, on, on this gradient here, and that you can sort of approximately compute this, that's this dashed line. You had a question? Yeah, so often we use the Amijo rule to locate the point, you know, because these conditions here do not give you the methods to find the points. Yes, so for us, the method to find the points is the Bayesian optimization. Yeah. I was wondering if. if uh, yes, so I, um, I remember thinking about the Amijo rule, and I don't have a don't recall whether we decided it was just difficult to do or that we were just so enamored with expected improvement that we decided might as well use expected improvement. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll just, after we've evaluated a point, not before we've evaluated, after we've evaluated a point, we'll decide, do we think that was good enough? So we'll ask after the first point, was that good enough? No, it's quite unlikely to fulfill the conditions. After the second point, no. After the third point, Oh, that's the third point already. After the fourth point, no, this is below our acceptance threshold, which we've set in some kind of ad hoc hard way. Um, by the way, so there are several parameters here which we just set in an ad hoc way, and that's not a new thing. Classic line searches also have these. You can see the C1 and C2 here. You can just open up a textbook that tells you, I don't know, set this to uh, 0.9 and this to 0.3, and that's going to roughly work. That's kind of what we did as well. We used some numbers from a textbook on optimization, and this cutoff line here is set in a very similar way. We did some kind of back of the envelope computation and decided 0.4 is a good value. Right? The point is, that's not something that the user has to do. It's just a black box that gets shipped. Like if you download a line search now for a classic problem, you also don't worry about how those parameters are set. You just use them. That's fine. Numerical methods have those parameters all the time. Uh, and then finally, we get to this point. We decide, very good, this is an acceptable point. This has a... Uh, a, a function value and gradient that seems quite likely to fulfill these conditions. So we'll stop here and run our outer loop method that decides to take a new step direction, basically. Does this work? So here are some uh, curate. This is a curated gallery of snapshots of how this method works. So these are, we let this run, training a neural network, and just watched a little bit for nice plots to come about and just stopped them at various points and collected them. So this is not a typical sequence of line searches, but it's a sort of a gallery that tells you what this, kind of, what this method can do. For example, it can severely constrain the step. It can decide that you went way too far and should move back. It can also extend the step. It should say, this doesn't look like a good step size. You should make more aggressive steps forwards. It can also interpolate. That's sort of a typical kind of setting. But what it does almost all the time, about 80% of the steps, it just accepts. It just says, that looks good. Let's just go. And that's good because it means that your computational cost goes down. And it can also deal with quite noisy settings where you sort of have to do a few more exploratory evaluations to be actually sure that you're down 
uh, even though kind of right because the individual evaluation is quite noisy. Uh, here's an experiment with like sort of from the outside. Um, in this experiment, Maren trained two different neural networks on two different architectures. Uh, they're both super like from the point of view of what current deep learning research is, they are super uninteresting, boring, classic kind of neural networks. Uh, they are both feed-forward perceptrons, two layers, and one of them is trained on MNIST, and one of them is, is trained on CIFAR-10. So these are data sets you can find in textbooks from, well, MNIST from like 10 years ago, right? That's mostly because we are not the experts for deep learning, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Both of these neural nets have several million parameters, or at least the second one has several million parameters, so it's sort of, it's not a huge neural network, but the space and the optimization is kind of high dimensional, it doesn't really matter because all we are talking about is the size of the individual step, right? Someone else chooses which direction to walk in, gradient descent, other grads, other delta, whatever your favorite method is, we're just talking about the univariate choice of how far to step. So now what you here, I'm gonna explain these experiments. So what you could do, typically, and that's sort of in the spirit of what Nando mentioned at the beginning this morning, is you could just start a bunch of different experiments. So you could say, maybe the right step size is 10 to the minus three. Maybe the right step size, or actually this is sometimes 10 to the minus four. Maybe the right step size is 10, maybe it's something in between. I'll just start a bunch of different initializations and try to find a good setting. So to do that, I could try to do some exploratory experiments. I could run this thing for a little bit and then decide that I've learned enough. This is some kind of freeze-thaw-like pro procedure. We could also run them to convergence. It's actually quite difficult to do freeze-thaw in such a way that you really get sort of a good final solution. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but the alternative is also, you could just say, just take this line search and just let it do its thing. It started with some initial step size and it'll just, just hope that it finds a good step size. So what we've done here is we compared these two approaches. These are Final test error after, Machen will have to remind me how many steps that is, 10 epochs. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, so sort of this point over here. Um, and we're, this is a setting where you do SGD with a decaying learning rate. So that's something that's sort of theoretically required to guarantee the convergence of SGD. You have to let the learning rate decay. But practitioners know it's not really a good idea. You sort of have to decay it quite slowly because you don't really know how to decay it. So, and you see that this does not quite work well. And this is all different initial step sizes. You could also keep the learning rate fixed, then you get this kind of performance. And it turns out that there's one value which is really good and the other ones are quite bad. So it really matters how you choose your step size. Or you could just start instances of this training routine with any of these initial step sizes and let the line search do its thing and it'll give you these kind of performances. So those are not always as good as the perfect kind of setting you could get if you would have started right away with the right performance, with the, uh, sorry, with the right step size, but they're so flat that it basically doesn't matter where you start. So you just start your SGD with step size one and let the line search figure it out, as it should be in a numerical optimization setting. So these are, this is basically the same plot now, sort of, so this is a slice through this plot at this point, right, final performance, uh, and these are, these colors are the same colors in both plots. This is SGD with fixed step size, SGD with uh, decaying learning rate, and line search. And you sort of see that this line search kind of drags everything together and just gets very close to the optimal performance. Of course, you would like to get rid of this final sort of little dip as well. Let's see what happens in the next few years. Okay, so this is the summary of the inner loop part of the talk. Um, Bayesian optimization is about using probability measures to reason about minima or about progress towards minima. And there's a way to use this even in inner loop computations because inner loop computations pose uncertainty problems. They pose gradients evaluated with noise. They are basically numerical tasks where the inputs are uncertain. You don't know what the true gradient is because you can only evaluate it with noise. Um, and there's a way to use this, for example, to choose the step size of SGD by using a GP surrogate, just like a Bayesian optimization, using a Bayesian optimization objective, expected improvement, on a finite set of points that uh, arise naturally from the GP surrogate to decide where to evaluate, and then stop the computation after the probability for the fulfillment of classic conditions reaches beyond a certain limit. This gives us a numerical method, a little black box 
on your shelf that you can use in your kind of computations that has no free parameters, at least none that you have to choose, which more or less gets rid of the problem of having to choose a step size. And that, for that, I'll use my final four minutes to introduce Ma uh, uh, Mike, Mike's talk, which is basically going to be sort of the, the continuation of this theme, because this is a, uh, uh, Neil is uh, smiling in the background because you knew that I had to introduce something like this, right? This is an example of a numerical method that uses probability distributions to perform a computation. It turns out, if you think about numerical computations a bit more, you'll discover that they're actually all performing inference. Every single numerical method you can think of, at least the ones that I mentioned at the beginning in my cartoon, are all algorithms that estimate something you don't know, given something that you can compute. That thing you can compute is maybe the value of an integrand, it's the product between a matrix and a vector, it's the noisy value of a gradient, or maybe just a gradient without noise, it's the value of a differential equation at various points. What you do in the end is you estimate something you don't know, the solution of the numerical task, given something you know. And therefore you're performing inference even if you're using a classic numerical method. It turns out classic numerical methods, even the ones that use no noise, can be interpreted as machine learning algorithms that infer quantities. And they are usually interpreted as the maximum of a Gaussian process posterior, which is why I'm telling you this at a Gaussian process summer school. So um, I think Mike will sort of maybe point out one, of, one or two of these connections, or maybe he won't, I don't know. There's a classic result that quadrature, classic quadrature rules can be interpreted as Gaussian process regression. They are due to, well, the initial idea to Percy Diaconis and the real deep understanding to Tony O'Hagan here in Sheffield. So I should point this out because I'm in Sheffield. Back to Greg Swaba and Percy Diaconis himself in his book attributes it. Ah, okay. So, uh, so but Grace Swaba's book is later than 88, right? It's 90 something. Uh, he did some work on this stuff, but Percy okay. Good, then I might have to change my, my, my citation for this. Actually, Percy in this book also cites uh, Poincaré in 1896. So I, I don't know who to cite for this, but people have thought about this for a long time. There are more such connections. Linear algebra methods, nonlinear optimization methods, and solvers for differential equations can also be interpreted as map estimates under certain Gaussian priors. That includes these local high dimensional optimization routines like BFGS quasi Newton methods. So the Bayesian optimization really already applies. Like BFGS is basically already a Bayesian optimization routine. It's just a routine that poses different kind of requirements. It's not trying to find a global maximum, but it's inferring something that it cannot directly observe. Um, so what we need to sort of use this idea everywhere is not just to have a big outer loop around this entire thing that tries to optimize the methods we use, but also to treat these individual little gray or black boxes as inference algorithms, as probabilistic numerical methods, which can take as inputs uncertain descriptions, like for example, noisy gradients, and return as output probability measures, like for example, the probability for the Wilford conditions to be fulfilled, or the probability for some location to be the minimum of, the, of a function. That's what people like Mike and I would like to call probabilistic numerics, this kind of bigger picture. Um, BO is an, is an example of that. I think Mike will talk about this a little bit more in detail. Uh, the fundamental idea is that computation, not just optimization, but computation is inference. Any kind of computation that tries to compute something that cannot be analytically evaluated is essentially inference. And using this insight allows you to build, to build new methods that can deal with uncertain inputs, that can sometimes also get better performance if you sort of include more information. That, ab about the problem. Um, Mike will talk more about the Probabilist and Rags website, I think. I think, I think because I've seen your slides. Um, there's also a recent paper about, on, on this kind of big idea in the Proceedings of the Royal Society that's uh, open access, so you can look at it if you want. And there are various workshops, obviously not on optimization, because there already is a Bayesian optimization workshop, and we would not dare to intervene in that kind of uh, thought process. But for example, at this year's NIPS, there will be a workshop on probabilistic ideas for integration. And I hope it's not going to be on the same day as the Bayesian optimization workshop. I'm not sure whether we've sorted well, this out or not. I don't know when yeah. It's on Saturday. Yes. Very good. So you can both you can go to both if you're at NIPS. Very good. If you if you can't, there's also a workshop at MCM Ski uh, if you're more in the in the statistical fold. Thank you. See you next. Everyone need coffee. Yes. For the neural network training, how do you estimate?
uncertainty in the gradient. Um, so we use a little trick that's not by us, but by Anne de Kuhn. We use batches that are larger than one. And if you have batches that are larger than one, you can build an empirical estimate for the variance of the gradient. And if you, if you absolutely want to have single data point batches, you have to do something else. And we're not going to tell you how. But I think, so our empirical exper uh, 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 experience actually is that at least for these experiments, batch size one is not a good thing to do anyway, even for SGD without line searches. It's just not efficient. You want to have a little bit of regularization on your gradient. You want them as big as you can fit in GPU memory. That's basically so that's, see, that's sort of the deep mind insight. <laughs> Interestingly, if you, if you tell this to reviewers, they'll tell you, no, 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 no. <laughs> like the first set of reviewers said, batch size one is the only acceptable batch size. This makes no sense because you need batches larger than one. The second set of reviewers said, batch size 10 seems to be quite small. You should really have a larger batch size. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, like, I like your answer, as large as possible. And if it's more than one, you can do statistical estimation of the variance of the gradient and the function value. Yeah, I think it's a, a very nice formulation. I mean, if you're building up, if you're building up models as you're going along, at the moment, presumably, you're treating each new step. So when, when you reset and you, you estimate your new gradients, you're, you don't use any of the information you got before. Could you carry on? Um, Yes, so the very simple answer is, of course, the next line search will get this point as the starting point. So in that sense, you don't, you're also right, of course, you would like to propagate any, everything you know about this kind of utility function through time. Well, not everything because you don't have infinite memory, but you want to sort of retain some good representation. Um, we're working on some, or Maren is working on some of that, so I'm not going to tell you the entire idea. But basically, uh, sort of if you look at this slide, there are already methods that retain some information about the shape of the objective function through time, and you'd like to do that in an efficient way. It actually turns out to be a numerically quite challenging setup because, because the space is so high dimensional. The line search is nice because everything is univariate, and throwing things away is kind of an easy thing to do. It also makes things more robust. Right? You, kind of, you, can, you, can, you can look at click pictures like these, and that's kind of a representation of everything that's going on. I don't have to tell you what happened before that because it doesn't matter. Uh, well, the runtime is essentially the same for all of these because um, it's it just 10, 10 epochs and a gradient evaluation costs as much as it costs, right? So the, the overhead for this line search is so small that you don't notice it on this kind of plot. It's, it adds about, what, 1% to the runtime or less than that? So, so think of what you have to do. It's you have to compute a posterior mean of a Gaussian process at a small set of points, like let's say three points, posterior mean and variance, so that's six numbers, and the data set size is six, maybe. Actually, typically, it's two. So it's two function values. Actually, sorry, four. Two, two function values, two gradients. So the gram matrix is size four by four. Right? That's not expensive. So it's not, this is not a case of Gaussian processes being expensive because you have billions of data points. That's, that line searches collect less than 10 numbers, typically. And then the overhead of making, doing these computations is Really, actually, the most expensive computation, as far as I know, in this uh, entire thing, is uh, to compute these bivariate Gaussian probabilities because we are using some MATLAB code that we downloaded from the web, uh, and it takes, I think, a bunch of milliseconds per evaluation, and you do that evaluation on average once per line search. So that's not something. If you have a large neural net that you are training and all these gradients you are shifting in and out of your GPUs, that this is not uh, a problem. The results, yeah. Uh, when have we, if you said the G factor is one, that means the equivalent is no. Uh, uh, okay, so weight decay is something completely orthogonal to any of these problems. I'm not sure we, whether we have or not, don't have weight decay, but it's kind of. It um, Sorry, this is step size decay. decay. Step size decay, decay. yeah. Uh, yes, so this is, this is with this initial learning rate and then the same decay schedule for all of them. And I think it's this one over, one over number of evaluations decay rate. Um, 
So it's, I mean, this, this is not the only thing you could do, right? You could add 20 more lines to this plot. You could do, I don't know, right? Like other annealing schedules for the step size and sort of there. There are also methods that uh, change both the search direction and the step size, like Adagrad, for example. So we've deliberately not have them in here because that they, then they sort of overlap. So I, at least for these experiments, we'd like to separate the effect of choosing the step direction and the effect of choosing the size of the step. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So we didn't tune anything. That would be a bit un would be a, a bit a bit a bit unfair to have yet more tuning in this, right? Kind of. The, the, these are. This is the tuning that happens, right? This is. These are five experiments, and you take the best one to say this one is better than the line search, kind of, right? And four out of those five were worse. So, you could you could do more, right? You could sort of explore a bit more elaborately and maybe find better versions, or you could do a two D plot of that, right? And also tune the weight decay. And then maybe you'll get a good choice as well. Uh, but the whole point of this is you don't want to do that. You don't want to run all these exploratory experiments. Um, I, so at DeepMind, people have the resources to do that. If you're a PhD student in a lab somewhere in Europe, you can't run your GPU cluster with 50 different experiments for billions of weights. It's, 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 really, it's really fun that, that we as a community call ourselves machine learning, and then we have to learn how to run our machines. The machines should learn to do all of these things. They should take care of that inside the loop, and we shouldn't have to intervene all the time. This is a tiny little way to get rid of one annoying parameter, and without outer loop patient optimization, just in the loop, just by looking at the numbers that are coming in. No. So this plot, I don't have in here because uh, but I know that Marvin has it. So it will eventually be on some slide. If you come to NIPS, you'll see it there. So basically, if you, if you move this line up and down, then um, you, you, sort of, you can make a plot that sort of says, if you move that line to 0, it's not going to work. If you move it to 1, it doesn't work. And in between, you get a very flat kind of U-shaped thing where it basically doesn't matter how you set it. No, uh, so we, well, we're doing. No, well, we're doing the like the gradient gradient descent optimizes all the weight parameters in the network at once. It's a one step of gradient descent changes all the weights, and we just decide how much to change in this direction. That's what the line search does. Okay. So after one line search, all the weights are changed. Oh, it's, like the, it's, like the rate. it's exactly like it is. It is tuning the learning rate, but it's doing it for you, and you're not doing it yourself. Uh, you mean the uh, the outer like the architecture parameters? But well, they're more there's more different. It's more difficult than to do a single gradient descent step because if you change the architecture of the neural network, then so then then you use classic Bayesian optimization and decide how many layers you're going to use and how many units. And, well, yeah. I, I mean I meant like uh, if you're trying to infer, so you can use search to infer which learning rate to use and just get the coefficient on every iteration. Um, why not Bayesian optimization anyway? Well, so I mean, that's basically what the, the question I had about Rembo. And uh, clearly, the objective function of neural networks is not just a low dimensional embedding. Because if it were, people would have figured that out a lot earlier. No, it's just hard. Just between trying to find a global optimizer. But that as well, yes, of course. Yeah. Optimizer, which is what we're looking for here. Yeah. So Rembo's aiming at the global. Yeah, I mean, but if it, if it would work on the high dimensional space of neural networks, that would be cool, right? Then would, you would even find a global optimizer of neural networks. Yeah, but I, I doubt there is a local, that there, is, there, is, there exists a low dimensional embedding of these. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think so too, because otherwise we wouldn't have taken 20 years to oh, make okay. larger and larger neural nets. So and there wasn't our brains would be way smaller. Yeah, that as well. Yes. Our brains would use mm -hmm. and it's the organism yeah. system of any system. So you had a. Question or do we? Okay, so you, 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 you're trying to avoid confounding, but you must have tried RMS proper Ada grad with line search, which is the obvious thing. So we tried um, Adagrad, and we uh, basically had trouble with. So Adagrad also changes the step size as it changes the direction. And we tried to get rid of that effect because otherwise they'd start to interact with each other. And we couldn't really sort of build a nice version of Adagrad that doesn't have that, that feature and sort of, sort of works in time for the deadline for NIPS. So we haven't done it. 
the, the answer that I'm going to give you is, uh, is a not empirically evaluated one, which is that if you separate the two notions of, if you manage to separate direction from step size, then of course you can combine this with whatever other method you use to change your direction. If you change the step size, then you have to keep track of how the step size changes by, the, by your outer loop and somehow inform your line search about it. And we didn't quite, well, I think we sort of know what we are supposed to do, but we didn't really get that corresponding experiment to work. So um, it's an inconclusive. Okay, so in the interest of tea and coffee, I would like to uh, postpone all other questions to the offline session during the tea and coffee break. And uh, thank Philip again.